last two terms. Um, who's the person yet to come? Um, Tim, yeah. Have you have you paired with Tim yet? No. Okay. So when Tim comes, you're in this. Yeah, here he comes. Yeah. Okay. So I just like you to discuss um, a simple sort of question, which is the challenge of. Um, fully recognizing the emptiness of inherent existence of everything. The challenge of it. Challenges. Well, challenges, <laughs> but what, you know, what, what, what are the things really getting in the way for you of really understanding this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
sense on an intellectual level. Okay. Anybody want to share anything with the group that came out of that little discussion? For me, it's, it's two sides of it. One, the uh, intellectual right. grasping of it and the study. And that it's quite challenging to understand. Challenging. Yeah. And there's also the, uh, the getting, getting rid of ingrained habits. The way yeah. you see something. The Absolutely. You see something that has inherited yes. Because you're so used to it. Yes. And it's a challenge to, to start to break loose of that habit that, and break it. That's called the innate self-grasping, and it's definitely the hard one, and that's the real one we have to crack, yeah. Yeah, the other one will follow on, really. Yeah. Okay, so you are not pretending it's easy, but we do know that it's the most important thing we can possibly do with our life, is to realize emptiness for ourselves and others. So, therefore, it's worth the effort. It needs confidence in that. Well, we came to that conclusion, didn't we? Yeah, we decided, <laughs> so, 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 even if we don't have, I think, achieve emptiness in this lifetime without yeah. having the Dharma, it yeah. might actually seem like we broke that as much as a bit, really. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, there's just a little bit more in this section, in the text, and then we come on to the mind only, which we may have time to just touch on uh, today. Um, if we, we now got to verse 11 on page 13, and um, basically it's the response to an argument which is stated just below those two and a half verses. And the argument is that if they're like an illusion um, that is sentient beings, in that they lack inherent existence, then that would contradict that the killing and the like of sentient beings are negativities. And this is, this is a serious problem um, f in Buddhism generally, that if something causes you to think, to abandon your um, ethics by, you know, by thinking, well, nothing, nothing exists at all, so it doesn't matter what you do, then that is a serious problem. So the Buddha definitely taught these um, less profound, less subtle uh, forms of philosophy for those beings who couldn't handle this view that Chandideva is putting forward. And so the person who's saying this is just such. They're saying, well, look, if things don't exist inherently, 
then there's nobody to experience the results, there's nobody to create the causes, uh, there's, n there's no negativity, basically, there's no positivity, um, nothing has any meaning anymore. And if, unless you really understand that, depend that emptiness means dependent origination, emptiness actually means that causes and effects work, unless you really understand that, there is a danger of falling to what we call nihilism. So this person is, is raising the spectre of nihilism, basically. And the answer starts in verse 11. And it compares the killing of an illusory being with the killing of a sentient being. Um, and an illusory being is like... Um, well, in the ancient India, they used to have these magicians who would... They might make some recite some mantras over sticks and stones and they would make an illusory person arise or an illusory animal. And so um, Shanti Deva is discussing whether it's negative to kill an illusory being, an actual illusory being compared to killing a sentient being. He's trying to help this, pers this person with the objection to understand the difference. So he says, the killing and the like of an illusory being is not a neg negativity because there is no mind. This illusory being doesn't have a mind of their own. They're just conjured up by a magician. Relative to those endowed with an illusory mind, um, that is, sentient beings who do have a mind, but it's illusory in the sense that it only exists relatively, it doesn't exist inherently, um, merits and negativities arise. So if you help them, you get merit, and if you harm them, you get um, non-virtue. Okay? Um, and then it's talking about, in the next verse 12, it's referring to mantras by which the magi magician creates these illusory beings. Um, Since mantras and the like do not possess the power, an illusory mind does not arise. In other words, when the magician creates an illusory being in front of an audience, um, it doesn't have a mind because the mantras don't actually have the power to create a mind. It's a bit like artificial intelligence or something like that in a way. Uh, you know, you can create this robot um, and, you know, if somebody kills a robot, even if it's shaped like a human, it's not actually negativity because that, that robot does not have a mind. And it's impossible for, um, art, you know, someone to create a mind through artificial intelligence. I mean, they think they can, but they can't produce a mind. They can produce something that simulates a mind. So that's probably a modern equivalent. So since mantras and the like do not possess the power, an illusory mind does not arise. We could say since artificial intelligence does not possess the power, an illusory mind does not arise. The illusion that arises from manifold conditions is also manifold. So... Um, this is commented on um, in the penultimate paragraph on that page where it says in the second sentence, the illusion that arises from various conditions also appears in various ways. The also does, does not eliminate sentient beings. Um, where's the also? Is it um, is also manifold in verse twelve? Is it, uh, the illusion that arises from manifold. Oh yes, it's also, it's manifold. also manifold. Yeah, that's true. Yes, it does not eliminate sentient beings. Can I just ask? Uh, yeah. I don't quite understand what that means. Manifold. Manifold means ver 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 with variety, M um, many, many manifestations, many various manifestations. So the illusion that arises from a variety of conditions also has a lot has variety. So is that talking about is that um, pointing to dependent origination there of this y manifold condition? Yes, it it is. Yes, uh, that one needs various conditions for various results is because it's impossible for one result to generate all results. Ah, that's what it's referring to. In the final paragraph, there's commentary on it. Yeah, in, in 13 AB, that one condition can do it all is totally non-existent anywhere. So uh, everything 
is a result of many causes. Everything that arises is a result of many causes. And um, in the case of negativity, it's the result of um, the intention and also the fact that you're, you know you're killing a sentient being with a mind. It does say at the beginning that if you, if you think that an illusory being has a mind and you try to kill it, then there is some negativity because you're actually trying to kill what you think is a sentient being. Yeah, I think it. I think it can do. Um, if you, it depends whether you believe in it or not. If you believe that it's a person, they definitely plant seeds. Yeah, maybe it, maybe it influences you. A bit like playing a computer yeah. game. Yeah. yeah, yeah, where there's lots of killing, yeah. and you know it's not true, but somehow it's giving you that energy. Yeah, yeah it must must have some effect, but it, you don't create the karma of killing for sure. You, would, um, you might create a slight tendency towards aggressive behavior or something like that. I don't know. Some people argue even that you work off your aggressive behavior. I, I, I can't comment. I don't know. But you certainly wouldn't accumulate the karma of killing from killing a computer being. They work themselves up. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that the computer game is the cause of influencing their mind? Maybe it is. I don't know. So there's lots of discussion about that sort of thing, and it's not certain. You were killing some, killing somebody in India with the game. Yeah. That would be a, wouldn't be quite the crime of killing the other person. No, it wouldn't give you the karma of killing, definitely. That's, that's, that's the main point he's saying. But it might, it might set up a tendency, yeah. or it might reinforce a tendency that's, that's already there, yeah. That's right. You know, people do that so much. But they win, don't they, really? Mm -hmm. What about motivation? Because I think in the life in water, I'm told you do in the... Yes. After all. It's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then when they come back, they might get drunk and kill somebody in a pub. But, you know, it's difficult. But then not everybody does that. Well, most of them just come back and go back to normal life, even if they're a bit messed up normal. A bit, yeah, I think so. I think it's quite normal. Yeah. I think maybe that's also a bit where the mind-soul conditions come in, because if somebody, if, if, the, if somebody is killing in the context of war, mm -hmm. they're being Okay, so now we get carry on over the page, page 14. And this is about Nirvana, um, because if Nirvana is the ultimate and samsara the illusory, then also the Buddha would circle, that means circling samsara. What would be the point of the Bodhisattva's practice? If the continuity of the conditions is not cut off, then the illusion will also not be reversed. So this is the qualms of, of this opponent, of Shant to Shantideva. Um, who, and then if the continuity of the conditions is cut off, then it will not arise even conventionally. Okay, so I think that's Shantideva's reply. This, this, is, this is better explained in the commentary, I think. So then it says underneath, the Majjhimaka, the middle way philosophers like Shantideva, accept that there is no ultimate birth or death. Okay? So there's no ultimate birth or death. That the lack of inherent existence is the natural liberation. So in other words, we already have the natural liberation 
which is the empty nature of our self. And that the birth, death and so forth established by karma and afflictions are cyclic existence. So we've always been empty since beginningless time. In other words, we've always had this natural nirvana or this nature of liberation. But due to ignorance, which creates karma and afflictive emotions, we are trapped in samsara for now. So that's the position of the Madhyamikas. And then the Satrantika, which is a lower school, opponent argues, if the ultimate or natural liberation is actually liberation, then although this emptiness of inherent existence of psychic existence is ultimate liberation, the continuity of circling, that means going round and round in samsara, albeit an illusory way through birth and death, is cyclic existence. Yeah? In that case, there would be a common basis for cyclic existence and liberation. In other words, both cyclic existence and liberation both have this common basis of natural nirvana, which is the emptiness of inherent existence. That's the, the, we, we accept that which would mean that even the Buddhas circle in cyclic existence. Okay, we don't actually accept that, so we're going to argue against that. In that case, it would be pointless for bodhisattvas to practice the bodhisattva trainings in order to attain enlightenment. Yes, it would be if what you just said was true, but it's not. Answer. There is no such fault because there is a difference between natural liberation and the liberation purified of the adventitious. So let me just explain. Natural nirvana is the emptiness of self or the emptiness of the mind. The nirvana that's actually achieved is the removal of the obscurations to liberation, the, what we call cessation, the truth of cessation. That is something that you have to actually work for. And in one way you're actually removing negativities, in another way you're just revealing the natural nirvana which is already there. Something like that. Okay? Is everybody comfortable with that? Yeah? It's good. The f if you get that, then you really can get a lot. Because it's really, really positive to recognize that we already have the natural nirvana, and what we've just got to do is remove the obscurations, and it will be revealed. It's, it's very similar to the Buddha nature theory, actually. Okay. Um, so... Yeah, the liberation purified the adventition. The natural liberation does not depend on meditating on the path because it is the suchness of all, irrespective of whether one meditates on the path or not. The liberation free from adventitious stains needs to be attained by cutting off the taking of rebirth in cyclic existence through the continuity of birth and death. Although it lacks inherent existence, if one does not cut the continuity of the conditions, one cannot even reverse an illusion, not to mention psychic existence. If one does, does cut the condition, continue to the conditions of ignorance and so forth, then psychic existence will not even arise in an illusory way. So that means that the Buddha doesn't even experience the illusion of being in psychic existence, even though Buddha, Shakyamuni, manifested in this world and we could even look at some of the higher beings since then, such as maybe the Dalai Lama, manifest in this world, but do not even have the illusion of being in cyclic existence. They're, it's just like a show. It's just a manifestation. And that's quite hard for us to understand, because they look like an ordinary human. Um, so we have to do quite a lot of sort of inference, really, that that, that person is actually beyond samsara, and is just manifesting for our benefit. So then, um, where did we get to? Yeah, 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 yeah. If one does, the very last paragraph. In the earlier debate, one needs to. Oh, yeah, I didn't understand this anyway. <laughs> I'm not sure which earlier debate he's talking about. One needs to answer by making a distinction between ultimate liberation and liberation rather than answering another way, because the opponent accepts that the Buddhas do not circle and that sentient beings do. Yeah. 
Ultimate liberation is full enlightenment. Liberation is just liberation from samsara. The opponent accepts that the Buddhas do not circle. Yeah? The, 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 the opponent, that's the Sautrantikas, they believe that the Buddhas are not in psychic existence and they believe that sentient beings are. So on that we agree. But I don't quite understand what he's saying in the final paragraph. I'm sorry. Okay, now, there is now quite a series of verses about the mind-only school in which Shantideva, the Prasangika Majamika school, debates with the mind-only school, the Chittamatran school. And this does throw up some interesting points. Um, I think I'll try and go quite quickly through these verses because um, first of all, we're, we're approaching the end of the afternoon, but also I don't want to get too bogged down in the details. Let's see if we can go through it quite quickly, and then we'll do uh, some more meditation, certainly before we finish, and have an open group discussion on whatever points have come up for you in general. So, refuting the mind only in particular, top of 15. Expressing the view and then refuting it. So expressing the view is expressing the Chittamatran view. If even the mistaken is non-existent, what takes the illusion as its object? So he's talking about the mistaken consciousness. And... For the mind-only school, the mistaken consciousness is not ultimately non-existent. It's ultimately existing. Because they have to have, they feel they need to cling on to something as truly existing. So for them, it's the consciousness. So they're this is, a bit, the, is this the consciousness that's apprehending? It's just the thinking? general consciousness. And they, they feel that, it mu that each moment of it exists truly, exists inherently from its own side. And yet they, they know that the middle way, the prasangika, majimikas, they are saying that not even the consciousness exists from its own side at all. Everything's just interdependent. But they feel a bit worried by that because they, they like the other realists, they think that if if things don't have any inherent existence at all, it means they don't exist at all. And so this is their basic problem, not understanding. So um, that's exactly what the answer is. This again is the debate, that if it exists, it has to exist inherently. This is the Majamika response to that. And then in the next uh, 16AB, when for you the illusion is non-existent, At that time, what becomes the object? So this is the Majamika's um, point. If the object held by you, the mind only, existed in the way it appears when it is held. See, the mind only also say the objects don't exist the way they appear, because they say they appear external, but they don't exist external. This microphone appears to be external to my mind, but according to mind only, it doesn't exist external to my mind. It's just an image of my mind, and the image and the mind appear experiencing it both come from a comic karmic seed, and it's the karma to be born in a world where there's microphones, basically. And so, therefore, the, the experience of microphone arises for each of us because we each have that karma to, be, to, to live in the world where microphones exist. And actually, the microphone is just a, a, a sort of like an image of our mind which um, is just an as uh, our mind has got a subject aspect and an object aspect, and that they all have the nature of mind. So the microphone has the nature of mind, and it's not external. So, um, therefore, it doesn't exist the way it appears for the mind-only school. Um, in that case, that's similar to an illusion and the mind taking as its object become non-existent. Oh, if it existed the way it appears, but it, it is, 
it, it, if it does not exist in the way it appears, it does not exist inherently. So that's what the middle way person is saying to the mind only. For you, the object, external object, does not exist inherently. And in that case, according to you, it would have to be non-existent. Well, they don't accept it as non-existent. If there is no apprehended illusory object appearing as an external object, at that time, what is taken as object at that time? Yeah, that's the next the next bit. That's a bit further on, isn't it? And that's is, is that the argument about the um, something to do with the sword and the blade? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the arguments. Yeah. Whether the sword the sword can't cut itself, mm -hmm. and then there's a discussion about the light illuminating yeah, itself, right. and there's there's this whole series of examples. The Chitta Matran believes that. Um, the mind exists inherently, and the middle way person, the Majjhimika Prasangika, says no, it doesn't exist inherently, nothing exists inherently. And they really just can't kind of, they don't really connect very well. Um, so, the, in response, so when the, the Majjhimika says, when, when for you the illusion is non existent, at that time what becomes the object? Um, and and the, the, the answer from the Chittamatra in 16 CD is, in case it exists in another way, the aspect is mind itself. So it doesn't exist in the way it appears as an external object. It exists in a different way, because the aspects of form and the like are the substances of mind itself. That's what the Chittamatra believes. Okay, then next verse, um, when the mere mind is an illusion, that's what, so the Chittamatra is challenging, when the mere mind is an illusion, at that time what is seen by what? So they're saying there's nothing to see anything. Um, and then, yeah, so they think that there's two aspects of consciousness. One is a one directed to outside, which seem, which appear, which, to which things appear as external, and there's another aspect of mind which is drawn inwards that sees itself, and it's called a self-knower. And um, this is refuted in various ways by the uh, by Shantideva. Even the protector of the world ha said that mind does not see mind. So. These Chittamatrans believe that every time we have any experience, we're also seeing the mind that sees, that has the, the mind that has the experience. And um, so they, they're saying that the mind is observing itself with this self-knower aspect. And the Majjhimika doesn't accept that there's such thing as a self-knower. Even the protector of the world said that mind does not see mind. The edge of a knife does not cut itself. It's the same for mind. Okay, so that image is very, very clear. The, the knife does not cut itself. Um, and then going on to the next verse, um, the Chi Tamatra says it's just like a candle um, perfectly illuminating itself. So, you know, we might look at the candle and say the candle is illuminating itself and just like that the mind knows itself, can see itself. And the middle way person replies, um, the candle light is nothing to be illuminated. In other words, it doesn't need to be illuminated, it's just naturally visible. And then as an argument they say, um, because darkness does not obscure. In other words, darkness does not obscure itself. Darkness does not obscure darkness. Darkness obscures anything to be seen. And the candlelight illuminates whatever it shines on. It does not illuminate itself. So the Majjhimikas are saying, yes, we agree. The mind is like a candle. 
but it does not illuminate itself. It just illuminates whatever it shines on, and that's how the mind works too. Um, okay, it gets a bit tied up, but still. Unlike a crystal, blue does not depend on something else to be blue. Okay, so this example, um, which is unpacked in the middle of 17, it's like you've got a clear crystal, and when you put it on something blue, it looks as if the whole crystal is blue. So the Chittamatra uses this um, as an ex Oh yeah, so this is an example of... And then, and then the Chittamatra says that lapis lazuli is naturally blue. So it's like it, it makes itself blue. So they're saying that's a bit like the mind knowing itself. And then, but the Majjhimika says that the blue of the lapis lazuli generated as blue independently from something else is not valid because blue does not by its own self generate itself in the nature of blue. In other words, it's blue because of certain causes like maybe chemicals in the stone, we would say, or because the mind seeing it knows it as blue. It's not naturally blue from its own side. Uh, so this, these arguments are all about uh, self-existence, really. So, unlike a crystal, blue does not depend on something else to be blue. Likewise, some are seen to depend on others, and yet some also are not. That which is not blue cannot produce itself as blue out of its own nature. Okay, so it's kind of like the emptiness view of Shantideva and the Prasangika is that everything depends on its own causes and conditions. Everything depends on, its, on something else. Nothing exists without depending on something else. That's the main point, really, including the mind. There's nothing, the mind does not exist independently. That's impossible. Okay, and then in verse 21, if the statement, the candle flame illuminates, is made upon knowledge by consciousness, then the statement, awareness is luminous, is made upon knowledge by what? Then the commentary at the bottom of the page, if one says, although the candle does not illuminate itself, it is illuminated, and says likewise, it is known by consciousness. And consciousness does not illuminate itself. Instead, one has to say consciousness illuminates, and this statement will be made after it is known like this, by which consciousness of different substance. This is invalid. Oh my gosh, this is so... This is impossible. Sorry, reducing the meaning. So is this... Um, I've got a bit rusted off now. So is this I don't blame you. Is this the Chisholm Larkins? Yeah. Verse 20 it doesn't now. say that, actually. He usually would Sorry, put... Rostock, no, you're absolutely right. It's a very valid point. I think this is still part... I think this is all part of the answer. Um, I'm going to revert to um, so Tibetan Jimpa. So the refuting, so the refuting, this is, so the argument, this is what the Chitamarkans are saying, and the answer, this is what the Prasanga... Yeah, Prasangika, Prasangika are saying. Yeah. Um, Shantideva argues that even the very fact of illumination is dependent on other factors. I think that's the main point. There cannot be illumination without something that is illuminated. This is the Dalai Lama. Similarly, there cannot be a cognition without an object. It would be like speaking about the child of, a, of an infertile parent. It cannot be a cognition without an object. And then they, they've got uh, about memory. Okay, so that's covered verse 21 and 22, I think. If the state, yeah, to remark about it being illuminated or not illuminated when it is not seen by anything is pointless. Okay. Yeah, this is all Chitta Matra. Um, okay, so one of the reasons why the Chitta Matra think that consciousness knows itself is because they think that is an explanation for memory. That when we remember something, we remember the mind that 
that was there at the time experiencing the thing. And so in verse 23, the Chittamatran says, if there is no self-knower, how can one remember consciousness? And um, what the Majjhimika says, it's like um, we remember it in relation to the experience of something else. So it's like, if I remember what I ate for lunch, I don't actually remember the consciousness that was um, experiencing the lunch. I just remember the lunch. And then I can figure out from that that my mind was experiencing the taste of the lunch. And they give this, this example of the poison of a rat. And the example is that there's a marmot which is in hibernation and it gets bitten in the bottom by a rat which is po and it's a poisonous bite and it do but at the time it doesn't feel it but when it wakes up um, it has an experience of the poison and from that it can work out that it was bitten by a rat so even though it doesn't it wasn't it doesn't remember what happened at the time it can infer it from the experience now and the, and really the 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 middle way are saying that that's what how memory works um that from something that pops up in the present we remember the past like this morning coming round that square and seeing the beautiful square i remembered times in the past when i've been there and that was triggered by seeing the square this morning. It wasn't because I remembered the consciousness that experienced the square last time. Something like that. That's how memory works, by being stimulated. Hmm. All oh, right, and the thing, yes, the thing to do with the blue is it's the memory of the relation between the things as well. Yes, mm. yes. So it's basically that the mind only school want there to be a, an inherently existing consciousness that is the basis for all these experiences. And the middle way school, the prasangikas, are saying no, you don't have to have any inherently existing basis, you've just got interdependence. And that gives rise to experience. That's kind of it, really. And you don't need a basis to have um, a memory or anything like that. You don't need a self-knower. We've just got a continuity of causes and effects. Things coming together and experiences of which are mind experiences just arising in dependence on different causes that's really the gist of it um, my inclination is not to not to go further at this point because it's not going uh, uh, this, this section is not going to take us much further into this topic and also it's getting towards the end of the afternoon and we can only take so much and um, I think that if we're going to continue another time, we'll probably start the next section. Um, although, come to think of it, there was a very nice finish to this section. No, it's a bit ahead yet. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, we've got quite a bit more of the the, the, the mind only. So I think I think rather than uh, flog it to death, <laughs> I think I'm going to quit. Um, and, you know, we have got a bit of time left and I'd really like to use this in a way that is useful to you guys. Um, reflecting on um, what we've looked at today. We started with the purpose of the teachings and practices, the other teachings and practices for us to develop wisdom. That's the main purpose. That's Buddha's main intent, is for us to develop the wisdom, understanding the reality of things. 
And that includes the ultimate reality, which then we got to, to looking at that through seeing the two truths. So un through understanding that there are these two truths, we can understand that there is an ultimate nature, which is emptiness. And that by realizing that, we will destroy the root of all our suffering. That's quite the important point. But this emptiness that we have to realize is quite radical because it cuts off any inherent existence of anything without damaging cause and effect, without damaging, um, you know, um, dependent origination. Can I ask? Of course, yeah. Because I just got a bit of it lost off with the last example. Yeah. So you're talking about... Um, about the interdependence giving rise to the experience. Yes. And like sort of continuity of cause and effect. Yeah. And when you were saying that, it seemed to me, oh, that seems to, because earlier, uh, a little bit earlier on, we've been talking about the difference between emptiness and impermanence. Yes. And we've been talking about, you know, this idea of, you know, one moment arising, giving uh, birth yeah. to the next moment, giving birth to the next moment. Yeah, yeah, moment, yeah. I think you said was impermanence. Uh, no, that's dependent origination of cause and effect. That's ca causality. Right. Impermanence is the notion that there is a watch there, let's say, which changes moment to moment. Or a hand, let's you go back to that example, that changes moment to moment. And the Prasangika is saying, actually, there's no hand there at all, ultimately. There's just, just a relative truth, which is... Uh, be, or they say here, illusory truth mm. of a hand, which is actually a concept imputed mm. to something here. I can see that with the example of hand. Right. Um, but from the point of view of, so with dependent origination, yeah. it's causes giving, um, causes giving rise to certain conditions. Especially with karma and its effects. And yeah. Mm. If we... If we just come back to thinking about oneself, you know, people like us, going through time, you know, whether it's rebirth after rebirth or whether it's just within one life, different experiences arising due to different causes. We grasp at this me as if it's something inherently existing. But actually, all that's happening is a series of cause and effect. That's all that's happening. And if we can let go of grasping at the inherent existence of me and just flow with the cause and effect without grasping, First of all, we're going to be free from creating future causes because we won't be grasping, we won't have, be dominated by ignorance of grasping. But also we'll be in a much more flexible way to benefit others, to, to live a positive life. And also we could be free from fear because fear is centered on grasping itself that can be threatened, feel insecure. We wouldn't have any limitations to our generosity because we wouldn't be clinging to mine or to getting, you know, repaid for our generosity. We just give spontaneously, comfortably. Um, as regard ethics, it wouldn't be a big effort to restrain from negativity, you know, harmful action to others, because we wouldn't have a me, a, a strong, you know, grasping at me, who selfishly wants to neglect the interests of others. We would be naturally non-violent, non-harming to others. Um, with regards to patience, 
you know, for instance, getting angry with people and situations, we would be free from grasping at the me who seems to be having a bad deal and therefore lashes out. And we would be free from grasping at the other as, you know, somebody that needs to be eliminated, which is what anger wants to do. Uh, we would just accept it as something like a dance. Even if the person was physically hurting us. That's quite hard to understand. But nevertheless, there's a certain abandonment of self-grasping and emptiness. For example, when the Bodhisattva gave his body to the hungry tigress, which is an example of the perfection of generosity, at that moment there was no clinging to self. Therefore, even though the tigress actually, you know, devoured the body, the Bodhisattva felt bliss because of emptiness, because of realizing there's nothing inherently existing here. It's pure generosity. It's called the perfection of generosity, the perfection of ethics, the perfection of patience. And the word perfection is because they are um, in accord with emptiness. There's no grasping at the inherent existence of the agent, the action, and the object. It's seen that they're interdependent, none of them exist by themselves, not only seeing it intellectually, but actually experiencing it like that because of having the direct realization of emptiness. So if you realize emptiness, you are free to practice generosity, ethics, and patience without any obstacle in you, coming from your mind, without any hindrance of, you know, what about me, or something like that. It's just not going on. There's no voice like that. And this, likewise with joyous effort, which is another, the fourth perfection, with emptiness, it's unimpeded. One is able to continue with joyous effort, however difficult the conditions, because of the simple joy of doing something virtuous. So even when the world gets very dark, which it can feel sometimes these days, the joy, if the joyous effort is really pure, like purified through emptiness, then there is no giving up on sentient beings. However much they clamor, like I was just telling you earlier in the break about when I was in Israel, it's very challenging. But fortunately, I never gave up on sentient beings. I just found it challenging. But, you know, you can sometimes feel so overwhelmed by stuff that you just want to bury your head in the sand and just give up on sentient beings. It's too much. That's called, you know, reversing bodhicitta. Abandoning bodhicitta. So each of these, and then concentration is also another challenging perfection to practice, to develop shamatha, single-pointed concentration. So you need a lot of determination. And um, again, with emptiness, it really helps you to see that all these distractions and this laxity and these different obstacles to concentration just don't exist from their own side. So, with emptiness, all these perfections become perfections. And eventually, you reach enlightenment, which is where you've completed all the perfections, basically. So, as I said, emptiness is for the benefit of oneself, to be free from suffering. And it's for the benefit of others, because eventually, it enables you to attain the Dharmakaya. Now, it's the merit from the bodhicitta and all the um, practices of generosity and ethics and patience that you develop the rupakaya, the form body, which manifests for others. So they've each got their own causes, dharmakaya and rupakaya. The dharmakaya, the main cause is wisdom. The cooperative cause is merit. The rupakaya, the main cause is merit. The cooperative cause is wisdom. So, 
the two of them together, wisdom and method we sometimes say, or wisdom and merit, these bring about the mind of the Buddha and also the form of the Buddha, which are eventually non-dual. They're, they're like two aspects of the same. And we have the potential for that right now. At the moment we have a mind contaminated by ignorance and we've therefore taken a body which is product of karma. But this very mind has got the potential of dharmakaya, in which case it would no longer take a body um, contaminated by karma. It would manifest bodies for the benefit of others. That's a different kind of production of a body. It's not an ordinary production of a body. Okay, so that's kind of just trying to present to you why we've been doing what we're doing, to remind you that it originated with why we develop wisdom, and then the two truths, which is we basically spent most of the day talking about the two truths, um, trying to understand how they function together. In the end, we have to see them as just two sides of the same coin. They're not separate. As it says, one nature, different isolates. Two sides of the same coin is quite a nice way of understanding that because the coin is one coin, it's one piece of metal. But the two sides have got different images on. So they're like the different isolates. And the more we understand that everything has these two truths, then when we, when we experience anything, we start to become aware that it's not just the way it appears to be inherently existing. Actually, it's empty. Okay? Because it's dependently originating, it's empty. Because it depends only on other things for its existence, it cannot exist by itself. This is the reasoning of dependent origination, which is a very, very powerful reasoning. Because things depend on other things, they cannot exist by themselves. So nothing exists by itself. Because everything depends on other things. But everything seems to exist by itself because of our ignorance, our contaminated mind grasping at things as existing by themselves. But that's just our big mistake of ignorance. Okay? Our big mistake. And it's beginning this time, that mistake. So we, shouldn't, we don't have to beat ourselves up for being stupid because it's, it's ingra so ingrained from beginning this time. It's not surprising it's difficult for us to reverse it and see things as they actually are. It's not surprising at all. It's the most deeply ingrained habit. And anybody who's ever done something like give up smoking, you know how hard that is. But this is nothing, that's nothing compared to this. Because that's just the habit of a number of years. This is the habit of beginningless time, this ignorance. We've always been ignorant. But it's not true that things exist inherently. It's impossible for them to exist inherently. Nothing can exist inherently. It's, it's absolutely impossible. So that, that shows that our mind is dominated by ignorance because everything appears to exist inherently. And we actually believe in it in the sense that we just immediately ac ac assent to that appearance. Immediately, the whole time, our whole life we live based on things exist inherently. Whether it's time to get some lunch, or time to log on, or, you know, that bloody person there, or, oh, that wonderful person there, or whatever it is, it all appears to exist inherently. And we believe it. And so this, this teaching of, of Buddha Dharma is it's very, very radical. It's uprooting everything, in a way, for us that we've 
always, always believed in, not just this life, beginningless lives. But somehow, we are drawn to the Dharma. All of you here are drawn deeply to the Dharma. It's not just, oh, that's something interesting, sort of in a light way. You're deeply drawn to it. So why is that? You know deep down, this is it. This is what I need. This is what I want. This is... This is the direction, this is, this is true, actually. I think fundamentally, deep down, we know this is true. And we like Dharma because it reminds us of something that we already know in a certain way. Or that deep down, intuitively, we know this is true. It's probably because we've done work in previous lives that we are reconnecting with something that we already know. But still, we're in a world which is so dominated by ignorance that we're pushing, we're really pushing against the grain, in, in a way. Our, our, our families, our culture, uh, I mean it probably always was like that even in Tibet, but we, we've got a sort of more of a seri serious case, haven't we? <laughs> but nevertheless, these beings like the Dalai Lama and Lama Zopa Rinpoche and so forth, they have manifested during our time, and we have been able to connect with them. So, I mean, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's still good to be alive mm -hmm. at this time, in these dark times, and have this Dharma, and make these connections with the teachings, to study them, and also to be able to practice them, reflect on them, practice them, and re achieve some small development of our mind, some, some movement towards transformation. So, you know, even something as challenging as this, if you squeeze it hard enough, you'll get some nectar. You will. I mean, you've seen that today. And as I said, if you go over the sections later, like in the next, whenever, but before too long, Go over them again, what we've covered. I'm sure you will find that you start to understand the whole thing, except the bits which are really translated in such an obscure way that, you know, it's kind of almost impossible. But again, as I said, you might want to read. It, these two books are both really good. Uh, this is published by Wisdom. This is published by Snow Lion. This has got a new cover now. and um, This is a very old version of this book. Okay? But these are both really, really good. And it's the Dalai Lama, so I mean, it's really reliable. Um, Transcend uh, transcendent uh, wisdom. Yeah. Transcendent wisdom. This is a commentary from quite a long time ago. And Practicing Wisdom, which is from the early 90s, which is what, now that's quite a long time, too. This is, the, this is the front runner for me the of the easy one. to understand. This is the Jimpa one. This has got the most accessible English, and, uh, you know, it's just... I remember when I read this, I thought, wow, that is so clear. It's so clear. Jimpa has done such a good job on this book. That's a commentary on the... These are both commentaries the by the Dalai Lama on the root text of the ninth chapter. And this one is more based on the Gyaltsapje. This one is a little bit based on it, but it's kind of... But still, at our level, they're both good. I mean, you know, anyway, it's the Dalai Lama, so, you know... It's not really, it shouldn't, it's What's not really an issue. Like? <laughs> no, I don't think it's really an issue. A bit of me thought, well, why did I, why, why did I try to use this, this one when it's so difficult? And I just thought, well, we're trying to connect with the basic program. So that's partly my motivation, to be honest. Okay. So does anybody want to say any final words on today? or just questions, or sharing, or anything you want to share, say. Any kings up? Any kings up? I haven't got anything arranged, yeah. and um, 
It's kind of up to Fiona and Fiona partly. So if you see Fiona, you might want to ask her if you want. If you want to carry on with it, then yeah, yeah. As long as there's people who want to do it, um, I'm very happy. Yeah, yeah. And at some point, we'll finish the whole text. I imagine. Yes, it'd be good to sort of carry on with. The I think Fiona thought there were only three people coming today, and I think she was sort of raising serious questions about whether there was actually a demand for it because I think she's noticed quite understandably that there's quite a lot of people going to teachings on emptiness with Geshe Tashi at the moment, which is great that he's teaching those things. So it's c completely understandable to me if people would prefer to do that. But if you want to carry on with this and, you know, you, you let Fiona know, then perhaps something could be I arranged. Think also this is probably the first sort of, the first event of the, if you like, post-summer period. Oh, yes. Yeah, so yeah. Secondly, next weekend, Geshe Tashi's teaching on emptiness. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. So, and I think sometimes yeah. when there's two fairly big events on in the week Absolutely. in succession, yeah, yeah. I think there can be a bit of a struggle for that. Completely, yeah. So I think that's very that valid, yeah. Yeah. It's a bit unfortunate in terms of timing, but obviously it's always to do with availability and when you know, you're available or not, Geshe Tashi. Yeah, yeah, there's all these things come up, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, probably that's about it then. Um, so. Well, thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. It's been, been a great pleasure to me. Um, I quite feel like doing something to finish off. Um, let's just do a kind of meditation come dedication to finish. Let's just reflect on being alive at this time in history on this planet and particularly in this part of the world, recognizing that just our presence here at this time is due to our karma. Remembering not all karma is negative. There's something very positive about being here at this time. Also, when the world looks bleak or dark, remember that Throughout history, such times have come. It's not something unique to our time. Try to let go of the notion of just being the person we are in this life. And try to see also that even though we can talk about a continuum of mind, nothing whatsoever exists inherently. So everything arises and ceases due to cause and effect, including the mental states that we experience. Including the actions we create 
the imprints that are left and the results that follow. Everything is just dependent arising. Nothing exists independently from its own side. So on the one hand, there's absolutely nothing to grasp onto. And on the other hand, it's so worthwhile to practice love, compassion, aspiration for enlightenment and so forth. Because effects really can come from causes. Cause and effect and emptiness are not at all contradictory. They're just two sides of the same coin. And the coin is the non-duality of the illusory truth and the ultimate truth. One nature, different isolates. So just to dedicate the merit from my work today, make a strong determination before I die, may I realize emptiness. Before I die, may I generate uncontrived bodhicitta. It means spontaneous, just coming up whenever I encounter anyone. The wish to become enlightened for the sake of all beings due to recognizing the example of this suffering being in front of me. swiftly become completely enlightened for the sake of all beings. And may the Dharma which teaches this incredible path continue on this planet forever with the manifestation 
of the great teachers, the bodhisattvas, the Buddhas, always coming back. never be separated from the teachings in all my future lives. And eventually reach the level to lead all sentient beings to enlightenment. Okay, thank you.